preparation. Be ready for tomorrow by doing all that you can today, setting your goals. Set a goal that will make you stretch for what it will make of you to achieve it. What a brand new reason for setting goals. What an all-encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future, to see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why. The greatest value in life is not what you get. The greatest value in life is what you become. The major question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting here? The major question to ask is, what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become that makes you valuable. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. So there you have the two components of positive self-direction. Number one, self-knowledge. Knowing who you are and what you want to do with your life. And number two, self-preparation. Getting ready for the opportunities before they come your way. You need both aspects for positive self-direction. Figuring out who you are and what you want. And being prepared for the day you reach your goals. Being ready. Being worthy. Becoming the person you need to be in pursuit of what you want. What good is an opportunity if you're not prepared to take advantage of it? It's no good. Won't do a thing for you. Be prepared. Now here's what's called the self-knowledge acid test. Quickly, without thinking too much about it, quickly list your three most important long-term work-related goals. Is it a client you've been trying to sign for several months? Is it a major sale you've been trying to make? Is it a promotion? Is it a partnership in the firm? Quickly list your three most important long-term work-related goals. Achievements that you want to make. Achievements that will take a while to get. Write them down. Again, without thinking too much about it, quickly list your three most important personal and spiritual goals. Things that will make a difference in your personal life. Is it going to church more often than holidays? Grasping all you can from the Sunday sermon? Is it spending more quality time with your kids? Is it turning the TV off during the dinner hour and actually talking about the important things in life with your family? Is it making more dates with your spouse? Is it planning a much needed family vacation? What is it? What are the important goals in your personal and spiritual life? Is one of them making a conscious effort to exercise more, to eat better, to lose some weight, to get in shape? What are the three most important personal and spiritual goals that you have? Write them down. Doesn't matter what they are, just write them down. Now, take some time to really visualize what the achievement of these goals would look like. What does your future hold for you if you landed that big client? What does your future look like if you got that promotion? If you spent more time with your family? If you planned more outings with your spouse? What does your future look like? Really spend some time on this now. It's important stuff. What does it all look like? Ask yourself, is this really my goal? Is this truly what I want? Is it a positive goal? Is it important enough to me to become what it takes to reach this goal? Is it mine? Is it worth it? If your three goals on the career side and three goals on the personal side don't stand up to these questions, you need to take some time to carefully redefine a few things. Redefine your list. Redefine where it is that these goals came from. Redefine what actually is important to you. Redefine how hard you'll really work to get them. Now, there are two parts to this goal setting and redefining process. There's two parts. Number one, don't set your goals too low. An interesting thing that we teach in leadership, don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. 
Go where the pressure is on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop, to read, to study, to develop skills. Now here's the second part on setting goals. Number one is don't set your goals too low. Number two is don't compromise. Don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early years that I paid too big a price for. If I'd known back then how much it was going to cost me, I never would have gone for them. But I didn't know. Don't sell out. An ancient phrase says, count the cost. Count the cost if it won't make you happy to get it. If you become less in your pursuit of getting it, if it's not worth the life you'll lead after you get it, it's not worth it. Now let's talk a little more about self-preparation. Self-preparation has two benefits. The first benefit of self-preparation is that it moves you toward your goal. You've already got it in mind. You know where you want to go. You're getting ready for it. You're doing all the things you're supposed to do. And by getting ready to achieve your goals, you're moving closer to your goals. That's how it works. The second major benefit to self-preparation is that it refuels your ambition, your activity, refuels your ambition. The things that you are doing today are getting you ready for tomorrow. It's exciting. You know that you're getting closer every day. Ambition must be kept alive, be kept active, must continue to move forward. Otherwise, you're just daydreaming. You must keep active, keep moving forward so your ambition can fuel you, motivate you, get you where you want to be. Self-preparation. The benefits are, number one, it moves you toward your goals, and number two, it refuels your ambition. Be prepared. Get ready. This method of self-preparation involves three steps. Step one, carefully consider where the next opportunity for reaching your goal will originate. Where will it come from? Will it come from networking with your colleagues? Will it come from reading the last book that you bought? The book that's still sitting on your shelf waiting to give you some answers? Will it come from you taking the time to think it out? Where will it come from? The next opportunity that will push you forward. If you don't know, here's what you have to do. For each major goal of yours, the top priorities on your list, for each of these, take out a separate piece of paper, one single sheet per major goal, write down your goal at the top and start listing all reasonable resources. Write down every possible place that you could find the opportunity to achieve this goal. And with each resource, classify them. Ask yourself, is this resource a sure thing? A good bet? About even chances? Unlikely? A long shot? Ask yourself these questions and classify all of the resources you have written down. That's the first step. The second step in this method of self-preparation is to make sure you know what you need to do to be prepared for your opportunities. Take your sure things first. Figure out what you need to do to be prepared when they happen. Break down your preparation into concrete steps. Make sure that you know exactly what you have to do to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes your way. Let's say that one of the top priorities on your career list of goals is to get this new client. Let's take it one step further to say that on your resource list for this goal is to have a lunch meeting with a friend who just happens to be the mentor of the client you're going after. Is this friend of yours a sure bet on your resource list? Well, let's say he is. I mean, you know this guy is a tremendous consulting source for the client you want. The client you want really listens to the opinions and advice of your friend. So you're getting ready to have lunch with your friend. What do you do? You've got to make sure that you're up on all the knowledge and the industry data that will impress your friend. Make him realize that he knows someone who could benefit from your knowledge and your vitality and your spirit and your experience. Impress him. 
impress him so much that he goes back to his friend, the client you're after, and tells this prospective client of yours that he needs to do business with you. Be prepared. Go through your entire list of goals and resources and classify them. Break each resource into concrete steps of preparation. Start by working on the sure bets first, and then move down the line. The long shots will come through every so often, but start with the resources that will serve you best now. Get ready for the opportunities before they come your way. Step three in the self-preparation method is to do all you can to make each opportunity more likely to happen. After you've determined what you have to do to get ready to be prepared, after you've determined this, see what you can do to expedite the process. What can you do to increase the likelihood of this opportunity? Go over it and over it and over it. Use these three methods again and again as you assess where you are now and where you have to go next to keep moving toward the achievements that are most important to you. Step one, consider your resources. Step two, determine what you have to do to get ready. Step three, expedite the opportunities. And by the way, this method of self-preparation works wherever you are in your journey whether you're close to your goals or whether you're just starting your journey of self-direction. This method works. Have working knowledge to draw from. Continually work on yourself in preparation of where you want to be. Build a reservoir of thoughts and ideas and philosophies and experiences that are your own. Build, grow, change, get ready, be prepared. Be prepared for a life worth living. Now here are the four ifs that make life worthwhile. Number one, life is worthwhile if you learn nothing worse than being stupid. Life is worthwhile if you learn. Learn from your personal experiences. Learn from other people's experiences. Second, life is worthwhile if you try. Now you've got to take what you've learned and see if you can try your hand at it. Someone says, well, you can't try, you have to do. No, you have to try. I put the bar up two feet and ask the kids who can jump two feet. I can, some say. I can't, some say. I don't know, some say. How are you going to know? You don't. You've just got to try. Just back off and run at it. How are you going to know if you don't try? Now, what if you knock the bar down? Does that mean you can't jump two feet? No. You have to what? Try it again. Of course, you have to try. Try it another way, but try. Try your hand at it. When the record book on you is finished, let it show your wins and your losses, but don't let the record book show that you didn't try. Next, life is worthwhile if you stay. You've got to learn to stay... Now, you don't have to stay forever. Just stay till you see it through. A guy builds a foundation, and then he wanders off somewhere and builds another foundation. He's got these foundations scattered all across the country. I mean, no walls, no roofs, just a bunch of foundations. Not a good reputation. Stay. You don't have to stay forever. Just stay to finish something. Don't fall into the trap of less than refined sophistication. Stay till it's over. The fourth if that makes life worthwhile, one is if you learn, two is if you try, three is if you stay, and fourth if that makes life worthwhile is if you care. Caring is a unique human experience that is so vital and so powerful and so all-encompassing and so far-reaching. If you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care enough, you can get magnificent results. To lead a life worth living, you've got to learn, you've got to try, you've got to stay, and you've got to care. Develop your positive self-direction. Do these things we've discussed. Remember the four ifs, and you're on your way to building a life worth living. Second principle of building ambition is self-reliance. 
Number one is self-direction. Number two is self-reliance. Taking responsibility for your own life. Taking responsibility for whatever happens to you. Knowing that you have consciously made the decisions that are now affecting you. Knowing that what is happening now, today, is the direct result of your activity, what you did yesterday. Self-reliance is basically counting on yourself. Now, being self-reliant doesn't mean you can't work with others or trust others. Self-reliance means counting on yourself, trusting yourself, being confident with yourself, being responsible to yourself, trusting your own instincts, trusting the conclusions that you have developed from your study of experiences and philosophies, taking the credit that is due you, learning from the mistakes that you have made, being self-reliant. Gestalt psychologists give an example of being self-reliant. They say that you're responsible for getting caught in the rain. They say that by deciding not to carry an umbrella every day, you have made the decision to endure an occasional drenching. Translation? By not being prepared, you make the choice of getting caught in some of life's unpleasant circumstances. Be they rain, failures, economic losses, relationship losses, professional losses, personal losses. By not being prepared, thinking ahead, it's your choice. Now here's the other side of it. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success. You increase the likelihood. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success, of seizing opportunities when they come your way, of being ready within yourself to take advantage of once-in-a-lifetime situations. Some people tend to blame others for their mistakes, blame others for their failures. Somebody says, it's not my fault the report isn't done. So-and-so didn't do their part. Of course it's your fault. It's your report, too. It's your responsibility to see that everyone you delegated work to does their part. Now, you can't control what others around you do, but it's in your own best self-interest, your enlightened self-interest, that you stay on top of things, especially if it's going to affect your future. You think your boss cares that John didn't do his part? You think he sees John as the bad guy? Of course not. All he sees is that the report isn't done, bottom line. Be responsible for the things that affect you. You can make sure you're more responsible by checking in with those people who are working with you, the people who make up your team. You can be more responsible by saying, Hey, John, how are you doing with your part? Do you need some help? Can we put somebody else in here to help you finish? Now, if John consistently doesn't handle his part, you've got to replace John. If he isn't doing his share, you've got to find somebody that will. Or what? It will negatively affect you. You can't wake up in the morning that the project is due hoping and wishing that John has done his part. No, you've got to be responsible because it's going to affect your career too. Now, my approach to my better future very early on in my career was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. And I used to say something like, I sure hope things will change for the better. Then here's what I found out. They're not going to change. Somebody says, well then, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. When you change, when you get better, it'll get better. If you change, It'll all change. Don't put it on someone else. Hope that someone else will change it for you. Take responsibility for yourself. Take personal responsibility. You can't change the circumstances or the seasons or the wind, but you can change your reading habits. You can change whether or not you go for the skills, burn the midnight oil, turn yourself around, multiply your value by two, three, five, ten, that you've got charge of, that you have control of. You don't have control of the constellations, but you've got control over whether or not you go to night school, take adult classes, 
learn some new skills. You have control over that. And if you don't, that's your fault. You've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to be self-reliant. You, you, you. Nobody else can change your life, alter your ambitions, pave a golden road for you. But you can. It's up to you. Be responsible for yourself. Learn to reap the harvest without complaint. This is a sign of growing maturity. And here's where it comes from, taking full responsibility. Take full responsibility for everything you do. Be responsible to yourself. It's your crop. Whatever your paycheck is, take full responsibility. You say, well, it's my employer. No, it's not your employer. You can become twice as valuable, three times as valuable. Burn the midnight oil, learn some more skills, bring more value to the marketplace. I'm telling you, whatever your harvest is, take it without complaint. Take it without blaming others. Self-preparation leads to control over your life. We discussed this in the last session. Whenever you prepare correctly, taking all of the steps you're supposed to take, doing everything in your power to stay on track. Whenever your preparations lead to success, achieving your goals, you reinforce the disciplines that got you there. Success leads to reinforcement of the proper disciplines. If what you're doing is working, keep doing it. If what you're doing isn't working, change it. When you are doing all that you can possibly do and are successful at reaching your expectations, keep doing it. Success is a reinforcement. Psychologists call this positive reinforcement. We all know about positive reinforcement. That's how we train our dogs. That's how we teach our kids. That's how the trainers at SeaWorld can get a killer whale to do tricks and follow commands and work side by side with humans by positive reinforcement. When you bring a brand new puppy home and try to teach him not to mess in the house, what do you do? You reward him for going outside or scratching at the door. When you're trying to get your toddler out of the diaper stage, what do you do? You reward her with special presents, make her feel special for learning something new. When you're trying to get your older kids to crack the books and study, what do you do? You reward them when they get good grades. You teach them that the skills they are developing now will have great positive effects on their lives later. But you reward them now. This is positive reinforcement. Learning that there are rewards for doing something good, something worthwhile, something of value. The greater the value, the greater the reward. The better you do, the better your reward. The greater the value, the greater the reward. A bigger paycheck, a better house, financial freedom. It's all a reward system. Now, there are two major benefits of positive reinforcement. Number one, positive reinforcement builds good habits. If what you are doing, the habits you've gotten into, are building your ambition and increasing your success, keep doing them. Your success is reaffirming that these habits are good. Your success tells you that you need to keep doing what you are doing. By reviewing these habits that bring on success, you reinforce them, give them sticking power. Now here's the other side. By reviewing your habits, what you do every day, by reviewing your habits, you may find out that some of them are inhibiting your success. You may find out that what you're doing every day is bad for you. Or you may realize that you've gotten out of some very good habits. Somebody says, well, I've just gotten out of the habit of taking my daily walk around the block. Well, I guess you'll just have to get in the habit of being sick down the road. Somebody says, well, I used to read the books all the time. I've just gotten out of the habit. Then change it. Go back into your disciplines. If you've just gotten out of the habit, just get back into the habit. It's called discipline. If it doesn't work, don't do it any longer. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope that it'll all straighten out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severely to change in your favor. 
but we call that naive at best. If the habits that you've gotten into aren't serving you, change them. You can't keep doing this any longer. Don't wish for a better wind. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you where you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25, and it revolutionized my whole life. And here's what I found. I found it was easy. I became a millionaire when I was 31, and I found it was easy. Now here's my definition of easy. It was something I could do. I figure if it's something you can do, it's easy. But here's a little parenthesis. I worked hard at it. I made sure my disciplines were in line. I made sure my habits were good. I made sure I did all that I could. I found something that I could do, but I worked hard at it. I got up early, stayed up late, and worked hard from age 25 to 31. But what I did was easy, meaning it was something I could do. Well, you say, Mr. Rohn, if it was so easy, how come during those six years all those other people around you didn't get rich? Here's why. It's easy not to. How else would you describe it? That's it. It's easy to keep doing the things that don't work. It's easy to keep bad habits. It's easy not to develop the disciplines. 